All right, there's too much to say. Uh, let me, I want to start, a couple of people talked to me at the break, so I want to sort of set the record straight as to what I'm trying to do here. Uh, the first thing is, I'm not trying to say that Jesus is just a philosopher. I think Jesus is at another level. There's a sort of quantum leap to a, a kind of direct revelation. And then what that does is it sheds light on uh, the achievements of thinkers, like philosophers. Uh, I would even say thinkers like uh, scientists and people who write literature and whatever. Revelation adds some kind of light which does not contradict what's good in secular culture, but rises it up or raises it up to, um, to another level. So for example, I was just talking about Thomas Aquinas. I want to talk uh, briefly about um, C.S. Lewis and his famous book, Four Loves. And some of you may, may have actually uh, read the book. Um, I'm not sure exactly. I, I sort of agree with uh, C.S. Lewis, and in one way I don't. But I was talking about Thomas and Aristotle. I think that the Christian view of love is better than the Aristotelian view of love. And so I was talking to Terry and Dan at the break. And just to make sure that it's absolutely clear, I'm saying you see hints you see, um, you see uh, uh, sort of bits and pieces of Christianity already in the philosophical tradition. These people are just arguing. They're just reasoning. They don't have revelation. And it's remarkable. Very smart people talking about metaphysics, what's reality, what's morality. And it's just remarkable how they come to some similar conclusions. The difference between the Christian notion of love and the Aristotelian notion of love is that Aristotle thought you could only be friends with a couple of people. He says two or three or four. And so when he's talking about philia or love, and he talks about it in this very elevated way as caring for the other person more than you care about yourself, it's still, it's a very restricted kind of relationship. So you have two or three people in your life. You've spent a lot of time with them. You're willing to die for them. What happens with Christianity, there's all of a sudden a universal imperative that you have to love everybody. And everybody has to be your friend. And in some sense, you have to be willing to give your life for everyone. And isn't that what we're all doing as doctors, you're going to have hard lives. You're going to do lots of hard work. And in some sense, you're going to be giving of yourself, but not just for two or three friends, but for everyone that you treat, even people who are, um, who are uh, unfriendly, who are opposed to your beliefs, who are unchristian. So there is a way in which Christianity takes that seed of truth that's in Aristotle and pushes it up to a higher level, um, to a kind of uh, a universal love, which is better than Aristotle. So I'm as a philosopher, I guess I could say I'm an Aristotelian. But Christianity, religion, because it has this supernatural side to it, is able somehow directly through revelation pull us up and say, oh, yeah, that's true. But here's an even greater truth, which includes that and helps us to understand it. Aristotle had a belief in God. He believed that God, we can't do Aristotelian metaphysics, it's complicated, but he thought that God was the perfection at the center of the universe. And everything that was beautiful, everything that was good, was trying to emulate God. And so there really was a God, and he was there, and it, it wasn't a creator God because the Greeks thought that the world was uh, eternal. There was no creation. But nevertheless, everything good, praiseworthy, everything we look up to in the world was an imitation, uh, uh, an image in some sense of this perfect God. But there again, Christianity, I think, is better. Why? In Aristotle's God, there's no uh, sort of reverse love. We love God. We try to be like God, but God doesn't love us in return. God is so perfect, he doesn't need us. God is this perfect ideal. He describes it as thought, thinking thought. But what happens with Thomas taking Christian religion and trying to be a theologian, all of a sudden you have a God who's loving us back. So we get 
we love God and God loves us back and we get this personal relationship of love. What Christianity adds, uh, Dan Bessie was asking me a question, what he, Christianity adds to the uh, philosophical tradition is the, the, the love, the respect, the dignity of the individual person. And what happens with Thomas is then you've got an individual person as a God, and you've got individual people, and then there's a reciprocal relationship. And all that golden rule, for example, that Socrates talked about, all of a sudden it makes more sense because there's a personal God who's personally loving you. And again, Christianity is better in a way because what does God do? Well, we all know it's very difficult to be moral. We talked about the cardinal virtues. And as I said, Thomas wants to say, oh, we have this caritas, this agape, which then sort of um, explains really what's going on in the virtues. Well, God sends grace. God sends heavenly aid. We have something which helps us to be selfless and uh, sort of pushes us along um, on the moral path so that we can be better uh, people. So I'm not saying that, you know, okay, I'm a philosopher. The, the ancient philosophers are equal to Christianity, but I simply want to point out that in the Western tradition, all these very bright, great thinkers, in effect, when they start to talk about love, it's remarkable that in one way or another, they start to talk about things that then become even more conspicuously expressed um, in Christianity. Okay, so let's talk about C.S. Lewis, um, who most of you know. Um, in the book, Four Loves, he talks about four different loves, and that's what we're gonna talk about. I'm not going to provide a definitive answer about everything, but this is, uh, uh, C.S. Lewis trying to make Christian sense of love. Um, so we've got four categories. It, the only thing that I'm a little bit worried about with C.S. Lewis is that the categories are too um, black and white. They're too sort of mutually exclusive. He doesn't say they're mutually exclusive, but it seems to me that they, they come together and there's one kind of love erotic love, eros, which presents a great problem, I think, today. And many of you as doctors will have to deal with all the, uh, the damages and the, the, you know, the, the, my daughter's a doctor, right? And uh, when she was practicing in her residency as a surgeon, she had to deal with all sorts of things that, um, that uh, arrive, that, uh, that uh, come about because of sexual uh, impropriety, we could say. Um, there's a cost for all this stuff. It's hard to figure out sexuality, eros, desire. How do you make sense of that in a Christian way? So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so let me just go through the four kinds of love that uh, C.S. Lewis talks about. First of all, he talks about philia. That's the Greek word, as I said, for friendship. That's what Aristotle talked about. Two people uh, with some kind of reciprocal relationship that care uh, about one another um, in, in some mutual way. Aristotle says they should be equals and um, they should be equally giving to one another. This is agape, which is, I'm sure some of you know theology. This is the word that's used in the New uh, Testament. Uh, the Latin word deus caritas est is caritas. That's the word that Thomas Aquinas uses for love. Agape, as Lewis explains, and this is the general idea, it's the love that comes from God. And it's, it's, it's totally um, selfless. God gives us love, not because he needs us, not because he's in search of something, um, simply from pure benevolence. His benevolence overflows and sort of, it's so great, it, it, uh, it overflows and uh, takes us in its, uh, in its scope. And we have this giving, love as giving, total giving without any concern about um, receiving. I should point out that word, it's not in the philosophical tradition. 
the philosophical tradition uses the other words I'm going to talk about, that's a New Testament word. There's something, you know, words are special. That word carries a particular connotation of affection. So we have, uh, this is the love that comes from God, but it's like tender affection. It's, there, there's a sense with this word of a care, a, a special kind of care, um, a personal care. I actually, I'm not a classicist, but I did my own translation. So I just want to show you. Um, the important word here is hegap pesen which is, that's the verb form of agape. And so uh, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. If I can just give you, um, so this is the Koine Greek. So the New Testament was written in, from a philosophical point of view, I don't mean this uh, in a negative way, it's sort of, uh, it's a more dumbed-down Greek. It was what people spoke. It's a vernacular. It's an idiom. And so it, just to translate that sort of literally, the way that the Greek goes is sort of accordingly. In this way, then, had such affection the God for the cosmos, Theos ton uh, cosmon, okay? so had such affection the God for the cosmos that his one and only child he offered, delivered, gave up in order that all who have confidence or trust or rely on him will not be demolished, ruined, destroyed, but have perpetual life. And there's that word agape, and it is very prominent uh, in the Christian tradition. And it seems to be a new sort of idea about love, again, which is total giving. Here's a third concept of love that Lewis talks about, storge. And what storge is, it's kind of like team spirit. It's the love you have for family, for somebody who comes from the same locality that soldiers have for one another. Um, it's the kind of, it, it's sort of family-based, and it actually has an interesting connection with medicine. I don't know if you know what this is. Does anybody know what this is? Hippocratic. The Hippocratic Oath. Uh, I will talk tomorrow, if you want, a little bit about ancient medicine. Ancient medicine was practiced according to schools, so there were, there were actually philosophical schools. Schools of philosopher, they practiced medicine. Um, the Hippocratic school was one school. For example, the skeptics had a school of medicine. Um, this is from the oath. Notice what it says. I swear to hold him who taught me this art equally dear to me as my parents. So the person that takes you in, you're going to be an apprentice. You're going to learn medicine. You're going to treat them as your mother and father to be a partner in life with him and to fulfill his needs when required, to look upon his offspring as equal to my siblings, to teach them this art without fee or, or contract, and that I will impart the knowledge of the art to my own sons and so on. What happens is early medicine, it's family affair. It's a family affair. Storge is the kind of affection, the loyalty you have, uh, that's in a family. The ancient Greeks thought of the different city-states. You were part of a big family. You were an Athenian or a Spartan or whatever. Um, and so this love is the love and the loyalty that you have for someone that's on the same side. So philia, friendship, uh, agape, the totally giving love of God, and then storge, this kind of camaraderie and loyalty that we have from living with one another. Eros is not just sexual. We, that's where we get our word erotic. Eros as a god is the god of desire. And the question becomes, this is the kind of love where you desire something. You know, you fall in love with your dearly beloved and uh, you need them. There's a need in you. They are beautiful. You admire them and you just have to have them. That is eros. 
uh, it's, uh, it's a visceral thing. It's, uh, it has a lot to do with emotion. It's inquisitive. There's something that you admire, so you have to have it. Um, so this is the fourth kind of love that um, uh, C.S. Lewis talks about. And he's worried about it, as well he should, I suppose. Um, this is, again, the love of sexuality. And the Greeks taught a lot about it. For example, uh, Socrates talks about it in a dialogue called the Symposium. Uh, if we talk about ancient medicine, uh, I'll talk about that tomorrow, because there's actually a doctor in the dialogue that talks about love. But the question becomes, how are we going to, as moral people, as Christians, deal with this, you know, this kind of desire love, which, of course, we saw one of the, uh, the cardinal virtues was temperance, holding back our desires, disciplining ourselves. How are we to make sense of it in a Christian uh, context? This is from The Birth of Venus by Botticelli. Um, actually, C.S. Lewis has a term. He talks about Venus. It's a negative term. Uh, it's the term that he uses for sexuality, which is focused uh, on sexuality, which is um, reductionist, which is about fulfilling desire, which doesn't care about the other person, which is not uh, uh, associated with uh, a concern for welfare, for well-being. Um, you know, the kind of uh, sexuality you find in prostitution, in pornography, um, and so on and so forth, in uh, the promiscuous uh, activities that are, uh, you know, rampant in our society. So C.S. Lewis and many Christian thinkers are worried about this, and they're fairly negative, I would say, about eros. I think that's a bit of a mistake. Um, uh, the important thing is to have the right desires. It's not to get rid of desire altogether. Um, I thought this was funny. <laughs> This is a quote from Plato's Phaedrus. Somebody made a t-shirt uh, of it. Love is a serious mental disease. He's talking about Eros. This is in the Phaedrus. And why is he talking about love as, um, as a disease? Because you get crazy when you're in love. You do stupid things. You, you know, um, uh, sometimes innocent, sometimes not innocent. You, you're, you're driven, right? And uh, so I think what we have to try to do from a philosophical and a moral perspective, but also from a Christian perspective, the challenge uh, becomes how do we recuperate a notion of eros? And I would say that philia, storge, agape, in fact, they all work together. And certainly as humans, I think, um, well, we need to... We need the grace of God. We, we, to be motivated in love, um, we're not gods. We're not divine. Um, eros has to play a role because, and again, eros is not, it's not negative. Eros, if you admire something and you find beauty in it, so for example, the, um, the Birth of Venus there by Botticelli, lovely Renaissance painting, um, Anything that's centrally beautiful, we look out at the lake and at the, uh, at the rural countryside, and it, or you go to the Rocky Mountains, it takes your breath away. This sensitivity to what's beautiful and to what's good in a more general that's what Eros is about. But it's hard to deal with because, of course, um, if we... Uh, if we're not careful, and I'm going to talk about why, it can, um, you know, it can become disordered, undisciplined. And um, my daughter, when she was, uh, again, in her residency, she had to do surgery. And uh, I remember she, maybe like many of you, grew up in a society where we're taught that sexuality, you know, it's your own business and it's consent. That's basically what matters, whatever. Um, well, as a surgeon, many times you spend your time repairing all the problems that are caused by uh, s some kind of, you know, undisciplined desire, undisciplined uh, eros, um, fixing up people, dealing with venereal disease, dealing with psychiatric problems, all sorts of things that come about when, um, when eros is unbridled. 
temperance was there with the bridle when you just, you know, okay, fill your desires, do what you want. Um, that leads to disaster, which many of you will spend a lot of time repairing. Um, so the question is, how do we recuperate that? You can't get rid of desire, and desire is important, but how do we recuperate that notion of love within a Christian and within a moral context? This is the symposium. What's interesting about Plato, the symposium is just a fancy word for a drinking party. And uh, Plato wrote a dialogue called the symposium. There's the dancing girl. There you see they're drinking in the background. What, what's interesting, yes, this could be, you know, a scene at St. Francis Xavier University Friday night or whatever. <laughs> but what, what's interesting is that Plato and Socrates, Socrates always has this way of raising the level of conversation. So he doesn't say that physical beauty is bad, that physical attraction is bad. Uh, there's a place for it. But in the symposium, so this is a quote, love needs and lacks beauty. And what he describes is a ladder of love that goes up until you reach beauty in and of itself. It's very mystical. It's almost godlike. Perhaps it's, uh, it's Socrates talking about how we move from physical love to an appreciation of love in and of itself, um, which is beyond the physical, which is purely spiritual. Um, so that's what it's about. Um, here's from the Proverbs. I want to show you the three things that amaze me, four things that I don't understand. Notice how a man loves a woman. Uh, there is already in scripture a room for desire, desire between uh, male and female, between a sexual desire that leads, of course, to children, whatever. Here is uh, a quote. Um, this is uh, the story, a story from the gospel. Then Mary took out a pound of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now, we're often used to thinking about sexuality and about love and desire in negative terms. And I think it's a reaction against an exaggeration in our society in a certain direction. And I'll show you. Um, an example of an exaggeration. Uh, but I just want to point out, uh, here's a scene uh, uh, from the gospel. That's a pretty sensuous scene. Um, this is perfume, expensive perfume. She's uh, washing or wiping his feet with her hair. Um, and uh, Judas Iscariot complains about this, right? He complains and he says, well, why didn't we spend that money from the poor? And Jesus doesn't upbraid Mary. He, um, he complains and puts Judas, in effect, in his place. So even in the gospel, uh, in the biblical tradition, the canticle of canticles, there's an opening towards what? Towards beauty, to what moves us, to what, in some sense, uh, attracts us, uh, which is sort of the basis of what Eros is about. We're attracted to something and then do something to acquire it. This is Democritus, who was, he was called the laughing philosopher. He's a pre-Socratic philosopher. He was a hedonist. So here's two painters, um, later painters, uh, representing him. What I want to, everybody understands what hedonism is. Hedonism is the idea that pleasure is the ultimate value. And I think all, what's happened in our society in many ways is we've gone from a Judeo-Christian society to this emphasis on personal freedom and on hedonism, on the idea that what the goal in life is to have as much pleasure as possible. Now, it's way more complicated than that. You can ask me questions. But all I want to point out here is something that our society could learn. Even the hedonists say, you have to be careful about desire. You have to be careful about pleasure. If you just go, uh, go off irrationally, cockeyed, and you uh, try to uh, you know, uh, acquire every pleasure possible, you end up uh, in a pretty bad place. We're in a society which doesn't listen very readily to religious 
argument to religious um, belief. I think when I uh, told one of my colleagues I was coming here, a colleague at another university, he said to me, tell them they're Christians, but they need to learn philosophy because our society is so anti-Christian, it won't listen to religious arguments. So when you've got secular arguments, philosophical arguments, it will listen to those. So it's not to deny and it's not to push aside Christianity, but it's good again, this is the theme of my presentations to know the best in the secular tradition. In fact, it can be reconciled really nicely with Christianity. And it's a way to, um, to meet people who are often, let's be honest, very hostile to our beliefs. So what's the lesson here? The lesson here is, notice he says, moderation, sophrosune, it's an important Greek word. Aristotle talked about this. Increases enjoyment and makes pleasure all uh, the greater. Cheerfulness comes through the moderation and enjoyment of enjoyment and harmony of life. So we have a hedonist, and what the hedonist says is, don't get carried away with eros. Don't get carried away with desire. Why? Because it'll lead to self-destruction, because we have to be rational and intelligent and careful. Um, uh, human nature is not just a pleasure machine. If you aim too much at pleasure, even if you don't believe in anything but pleasure, it will destroy you. So, um, you know, you'll end up with a hangover and uh, your girlfriend will be mad at you and you'll lose your job and you'll flunk out of med school and you'll become an alcoholic and your life will be a mess even just looking at it from a hedonistic point of view. So we have to find a way to rein in our desires. From the Proverbs, this is just an ancient view. Uh, uh, the leech has two suckers that cry out more and more. What happened? Democritus says this, Epicurus that I showed you earlier say that. If you cultivate the wrong kinds of desires, at a certain point they take over. You start to use heroin, you go down to East Hastings Street in Vancouver, and you see the heroin addicts. They become so focused on a kind of pleasure that they live only for that. So e you have to moderate and um, you know, uh, use your intelligence to be careful about the kinds of uh, pleasure. I'm going to jump over this. Most of you will be offended by this. You should be offended by this. This is Michel Foucault, the history of sexuality. I don't know how many of you know about philosophy and uh, literature and literary criticism and history. He, uh, he, he just uh, recently died. He died about five years ago. Oh, yes, no, he's a contemporary uh, thinker. He's a postmodernist, a deconstructionist. This is what's going on in universities right now. I mean, it is. So um, this is Foucault. Uh, he died of AIDS, by the way, um, very celebrated uh, uh, French intellectual. What does he say? It is through sex that each individual has to pass in order to access his own intelligibility. We have arrived at the point in history where we expect our intelligibility to come from the plenitude of the body, from what was perceived as an obscure and nameless urge, the sexual urge. Basically, what Foucault is saying is, we've had it with love, which comes from the Judeo-Christian tradition. What's important in life is sexuality. Um, the planet, uh, hence the importance we ascribe to sexuality, the reverential fear with which we surround it, the care we take to know it. Over the centuries, it has become more important than our soul, more important almost than our life. And so it is that all the world's enigmas appear frivolous to us compared to sexuality. The Faustian pact, the pact with the devil, uh, whose temptation has been instilled in us by the deployment of sexuality is now as follows. This is a sign of, of course, the danger of the risk of where secular society is headed. This is a leading thinker in literary criticism and history. What does he say? This is the modern um, dilemma, to exchange life in its entirety for sex itself or the truth and sovereignty of sex. Sex is worth dying for. As I see, he went over to California and he got all involved in the sadomasochist scheme and he died of AIDS. He effectively put into practice what he was uh, teaching. 
When a long time ago the West discovered love, it bestowed on it a value high enough to make death acceptable. Nowadays, it is sex that claims this equivalence, the highest of all. Now, I am not, of course, recommending this. I wanted to put this up because this is a sign, a symptom of what's going on in Western society. What's happened is the religious imperative, the Judeo-Christian, that idea of a higher love that you already find bits of intimation, in, uh, intimate intermissions of, sorry, I'm not saying that right, but um, you get hints of in the earlier philosopher, it's being pushed aside, what for a kind of rank hedonism that uh, basically tries to find meaning in life through what? Through eros, but eros, this bad kind of eros, which is just pure sexuality. He's a pretty sophisticated guy. Um, he would think, so I showed you the slide of the Enlightenment. He's, most of these things are positivists, which means science is everything. So he would think that Aphrodite is a literary, a literary way, a metaphorical way of the Greeks who were too dumb to realize that the world is just material, is just scientific. So it's a literary way of talking about the importance of sexuality. He thinks, what he thinks he's doing is describing the situation right now. So let's go back a little bit in time. Uh, of course, I, I think he's wrong. So let's just be clear about that. But go back to Freud. So what happens already with Freud? And now Freud has sort of fallen out of fashion in uh, psychiatry and um, uh, in psychology. But what Freud did is basically he basically took Plato. Plato talks about the tripartite soul, and there's, there's reason or intelligence, and then there's the spirit or the willpower, and then there's the appetites. And what Freud does is he comes along and he takes, and Plato thinks that the soul is the most important, the seed of What Freud turns it around and he says the libido, the appetites are where everything starts. They're the ultimate explanation. The ultimate explanation is biological urges. What we're seeing is, you know, 150 years later or 100 years later, I mean, what happens when you get rid of the transcendental, when you get rid of the spiritual, when you don't have the sense that there's a higher level of values? Well, what we're left with is we're left with a materialistic universe. We're left with our own desires. And ultimately, those higher kinds of love like philia, agape, storge, they, they sort of pale in comparison to our urges. And I would say maybe we can talk about this in the discussion. One thing that you're going to all have to deal with as doctors is this relentless focus on patient autonomy. I get to do what I want. Uh, I actually think it's a cover. It's a cover for this. Um, because um, if you, you know, and I actually wrote a book about what freedom means. I don't think that's what freedom means. But if you define freedom in, uh, you know, or even health care in terms of this kind of impoverished notion of autonomy, what are we? And if you don't believe that there's a higher purpose and you don't believe that there's the supernatural and you don't believe there's an objective morality, what's left? Well, sexuality, eros isn't just about sexuality. It's also about the appetite for drink. It's for the, about the appetite for food. It's about anything that moves us. That's all you're basically left with. And in a, sort of an impoverished secular society, what he's saying, except he's going along with it, he's, he thinks he's just describing the way uh, things are, the way people think. This is Soren Kierkegaard. And, you know, there's an interesting thing about medicine. I say this to my, uh, to my daughter, who's the doctor. In the ancient world, with the ancient philosophers, doctors uh, were physicians. They were the people who took care of the body, and the philosopher was the physician of the soul. OK, so that it's like, OK, if you're a doctor, you got to take care of physical health, although physical health for the ancients had a moral and a spiritual side. But if you're a philosopher, you're um, you're a physician for the soul. So here's Kierkegaard, who was a Christian, kind of a 
a, a tortured Christian of a, a sort of um, sort of a Christian, sort of outside the church, but very Christian. For a physician does not merely have to prescribe medicines, but first and foremost, he has to be acquainted with sickness to know whether the, a supposedly sick man is really sick or whether a well man is not really sick. So it is also with the physician of the souls when dealing with despair. And Kierkegaard has this really interesting notion of despair. What I want to say to finish up is I think that what you see in Foucault, which is, I can't emphasize this enough, it's prevalent, it's all out there. You go, uh, you take your philosophy courses, literature courses, um, psychology, it's all out there. What Kierkegaard says is human beings, modern human beings, we are afflicted by despair. And I want to suggest that what Foucault is doing is he's in despair. And what you see, that, that relentless, as you, as you correctly suggest, that relentless emphasis on one physical aspect of our existence, satisfying by law, is a symptom of despair. Um, so Kierkegaard says, OK, You've got to be careful. Um, the physician knows what despair is and is acquainted with it, and hence he is not satisfied with a men, man's assertion that he's in despair or that he is not in despair. What Kierkegaard said is that the people that are the most in despair are the people that are in despair and don't know it. The person who knows that he's in despair and his life is a mess and is worried about himself, um, that person at least, they're aware of their sickness. We're in a society where Foucault is just one of endless example. A society, Kierkegaard thinks that modern society is in despair. And what despair is, it's hatred of the self. You hate yourself. You hate yourself so much that you want to get rid of yourself. And Kierkegaard sees this as a sort of a symptom of the modern, um, the modern uh, movement away from higher meaning, from spirituality, from Christianity, and so on and so forth. And I think what you're seeing with somebody like Foucault is you know, there is a part of human nature that is spiritual, that has a transcendental aspect. That's an important part of what we are. We can't make meaning or understand the meaning of life without. Christianity brings that to a head and, and, and expresses that in a conspicuous way we can make sense of. Actually, there's Kierkegaard. That's a caricature. He was, he was actually persecuted himself. But I want to finish just with this. So when you deny those aspects, what are you left with? You're left with physicality. It's not enough. You're dissatisfied. You're left with um, some lack of understanding of who you are, which ends up in despair and then ends up with this, these exaggerations of eros. I'm going back to Aristotle. This is what all the ancient thinkers say, and I think this is what the Bible says, too, and what Christianity says. Appetite is not bad. It's disordered appetite that's bad. And it's appetite directed to the wrong things. Remember, prudence was the top of the pedestal. She was the high cardinal virtue. What you need is intelligence, if you could say almost sensitivity, moral sensitivity. So we have desire. Desire is an important, it's a good part of life. Surely marriage and, you know, having children and all and courtship and all that sort of stuff, that's a good part of life, but it has to be ordered in the right way. So this is Aristotle, both fear and confidence and appetite and anger and pity and in general pleasure and pain may be felt too much and too little. But to feel them at the right times, with the reference to the right objects, towards the right people, with the right motive, in the right way is what is both intermediate and best. And this is a characteristic of virtue. He's talking about the mean. What seems to, to have happened in our society and in the modern world is it's that evaluation of desire that has been pushed away. 
We believe in autonomy. You get to do what you want as long as there cons there's consent. That's OK. But as soon as you start to focus in on that, everybody becomes a little god with their little desires. Um, the larger picture, um, the metaphysical picture, the religious picture, the spiritual picture, how you affect other people, the common good, that all falls away. And we get these little islands of people that are pursuing pleasure without trying to figure out which pleasure is good, which pleasure is bad. And uh, so the, 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 or which desire is good and which is, uh, which is bad. Eros by itself is a worrisome thing and a, a difficult thing to get a grip on. But if you have philia, this friendship love, storge, and of course agape, which comes through uh, through grace from God, then you can start to make sense of a world in which there is appropriate desire to what's beautiful, to what's worthy of having, to what we should strive for, whatever. But you, need, you can't have eros just by itself, else that leads to tragedy and to the situation we're in. So OK, that's sorry, I went on a little bit long. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to discuss and talk about whatever you'd like to talk about. Is there any hope to bringing people closer to fulfilling their mission as imagers of God by going through philosophy rather than a relevatory approach? I'm a historian of philosophy. Of philosophy. That's what I spend my life doing, um, much too much time, uh, rather than being outside and enjoying the, the, reading the history of philosophy. I think that's a skewed view. Uh, I mean, and it's, it's not coming from you, it's coming from society. When you take philosophy courses nowadays, what happens is, because of the Enlightenment and because of the idea of pro progress, people tend to think, it's a general view in society, what went, happened in the past was bad, or it was primitive, or it was, it was uh, simplistic. And now we've gotten you know, to the modern times, and now we understand. But why would anybody go back to you know, a 500 BC, or go back to the Middle Ages? In fact, when you study the history of philosophy, which really I spent 40 years doing, what's remarkable is how similar the most of the philosophy is. It's not exactly the same. And you have Muslim philosophers, and you have Christian philosophers, and you have pagan philosophers, and so on and so forth. But this idea that sort of philosophers, uh, that there's no common consensus or opinions that they share, that there isn't sort of a mainstream philosophy. Of course, there are always, in every age, there are always thinkers that are out there that are on the margins and whatever. But, um, but my view is that, you know, the, the School of Athens that I put up there, uh, in fact, there is a Western canon. The postmodernists don't like this, but there's a Western canon. There are certain philosophers. There's a reason why somebody like Aristotle is more important than some other uh, marginal philosophers. Um, and what you find in the canon is re it's consensus. I don't, as I said, I don't think philosophy pushes you quite as far as Christianity. Revelation is absolutely essential and takes it to a higher level. But, you know, I think this idea, what happens in philosophy classes, people get up and let's argue about everything. And there's a pro on this side and there's a con on this side. And you know, you can, what philosophy is about is about rhetoric. It's just coming up with reasons on one side or the other. In fact, that's not how the tradition operates. So I have a, a book I gave Dan about the, the history of Western ethics. And it's remarkable, as I've tried to show, it's remarkable how similar. Is there any philosopher who thinks that murder is OK or that you shouldn't treat your children uh, properly? Or that, I mean, let's take the hedonists. Because you know we're in a very hedonist society, and you might say, "Okay, these guys are all for pleasure. You know, forget about uh, um, uh, you know uh, religion. Forget about some constraining morality." You go and look at the hedonists, and even the hedonists say, "Hey, don't be going running around after any kind of pleasure. You got to have some discipline. You got to train yourself. You got to hold yourself. You've got to use temperance." This is among the hedonists, and this is what you find in the tradition. I mean, there are, a few, there are a few exceptions. And what happens in the Enlightenment time, David Hume, somebody like David Hume, um, you get a, re, a, a, a sort of a, a reaction against the tradition in philosophy. And we want to throw it out. And we get a sort of a liberalism. I want to use that word carefully. It means all sorts of different things, where we get this idea any view is as good as any other. 
but that's not my, I, ju I just can tell you from sitting down and reading these guys, no, you get a pretty coherent, to, it's, it's not all right. There are, there are mistakes in Aristotle, there's mistakes in Plato, whatever. Um, but, but I understand where you're coming from, and I wish that people would go back and read the history of philosophy, not so much present day philosophy, but the history of philosophy. And you would find that they're um, these great thinkers. They, um, there are differences, certainly in details, but there's a remarkable consensus there. How do we bring back temperance in this postmodern society? I think it is complicated. My colleague who said, you know, oh, I'm a Christian like you and I'd like to preach Christianity, but I think you you do have to be as Jesus said worldly and wise, as, as worldly as uh, serpents. Uh, I think the way you get it back is by going back to the great thinkers in the past. Um, Already with most of the great thinkers in the past, there's an opening to the transcendental, to the spiritual, to objective morality. Uh, I think actually m the postmodern view is not, how can I put it? Well, I, I don't think it's very bright. It's not very well thought through. Usually what happens with the postmodern, with the postmodernist is that they picked and chosen, you know, you take a little bit of this, you take a little bit of this, you take a little bit of this. They don't know the history of philosophy in, in depth. It takes a long time, you know, like Aristotle is like this. Thomas Aquinas is like this. I mean, to, to, to understand what went before. Postmodernism isn't all bad, okay? Because what postmodernism is, Okay, there's two things. I'm sort of going all over the place here, but there's two th points I want to make. The first one, what's postmodernism? Postmodernism is a reaction against an overly scientific worldview. That enlightenment, you know, um, picture where science is everything. Everything is an experiment. Everything is statistical. Uh, everything has to be proven. Everything has to do with your physics. Postmodernism, in some sense, is a reaction against science can't explain uh, literature. It can't explain love. It can't explain uh, morality. It can't explain religion. That in itself is, uh, is healthy because it's kind of a movement away from the, uh, the, the, the positivist picture that you know, religion and spirituality and objective morality and all that and literature and, and beauty and all that, that's just relativistic and that's just subjective. So in a way, there's something positive in it. The problem is, of course, what it does is it destroys any notion of objective validity when it comes to morality, when it comes to religion, when it comes to, 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 to art and beauty. There's, so, so there's a problem, but it's already uh, an example of um, some dissatisfaction with the modern world and with the narrowness and the impoverishment of the, of, um, the overly scientific kind of, we're going to explain everything through physics. All you are is a bunch of molecules and what you're, when you think your brain is just molecules. Postmodern ones say, hey, that's just a narrative. That's it's just a story. There's other stories that can explain the world. And you know, you have Christian postmodernists. But the problem is, is that if you're Christian, you want to say no, insist, no, that's Christianity is, um, is really true. And it's true in an objective sense. And uh, what, uh, religious uh, knowledge counts truly really as knowledge. And so the postmodernists are very soft on that. So it's not all negative. Uh, it's already a sense of people turning against the, the present worldview. What's the problem? You said the word indulgence uh, or self-indulgence. Let me talk about that. Aristotle has a word. The word is akolasia. Doesn't, so don't worry about the Greek. But what he says that what happens with self-indulgence is it's not simply people doing things that are wrong. So I think you've touched on something very deep here. What Aristotle says is when people are doing wrong things, they feel bad about it, right? He's got a term, akrasia, weakness of will. You give in to temptation, you do something bad, and then you feel bad about it. We don't like to feel bad. So what do we do? We make excuses. We rationalize. What the self-indulgent person does, according to Aristotle, is he follows his appetites. He doesn't want to feel bad. So he makes up all sorts of excuses to explain, to justify his immoral behavior. I think that's where we are as a society. 
So what, you know, so the person cheats on their wife and what the, well, it's evolution, you know, evolution made us that way. I mean, we can't help it. I mean, you know, that's the, the that's the way that, uh, that it worked out or everybody does it or, you know, well, it's just a matter of consent. My wife's okay, whatever. The point is when you're a self-indulgent individual, what you're doing is you're not objectively fairly trying to understand things. You're trying to make up an excuse so you can carry on and enjoy your pleasures and not feel bad about it. I think that's where we've gotten as a society. What religion does is it says, hey, there's no, there's an objective truth out there. There's, there's really a God and there are some standards and whatever. I think philosophy does the same thing. So where do we get, how do we get this stuff back? Well, by bringing back some serious religion and some serious philosophy so that the, the problem is this autonomy culture where basically if you're satisfied with what you're doing, if you're happy with what you're doing, if that's what you want to do, if that you've considered, then that's an end to it. No, what we have to demand is a rational justification. We need principle. You can't just do because you feel like it. What philosophy asks for in morality is, okay, let's think about it. Let's think about it in a, in a deeper way. Is, does this really make sense? I think religion does that too. And we've got to bring that back. But I think that's where we are, yes? In a hedonistic worldview, people will live their lives with the intent to not hurt anyone. And if they do, they'll just modify their behavior. So how do you present the case for top-down normative ethics as opposed to the bottom-up, more experimental ethics? Well, so okay, let's go back and look at what does the philosophical tradition say. Aristotle has a word for uh, happiness. The word is eudaimonia. And it's an interesting word. To translate it into Christian terms, what it really means is having a good guardian angel. That's really what it means. It means daimon is the Greek word for demon, but it's not always a bad demon. You is the Greek word for good. It's having a good angel. And the Greeks believed in destiny and, and um, fate. And uh, what you wanted to do to be happy was to have a good, admirable fate. What does that mean? It means that an objective, an objective audience in looking at your life would look at it and say, wow, that was a good life. Wow. I'm impressed with that. Aristotle says the time to find out when your life is good is, Terry, you probably know, I mean, the time to find out when your life is good is on your deathbed. And when you sit there on your deathbed and you look back and if you can say, well, you know, sure, I had some hard times. I did some, I had a pretty good life. I, uh, that's when you can tell that if you're happy. Now, what does this, what's wrong with the, the modern view that you described? In order to be happy, you have to have self-esteem. You don't get self-esteem by just following eros, by enjoying your pleasures. By Aristotle thinks that, you know, and I teach ethics to students, um, Aristotle thinks you can only be happy if you're proud of yourself. The only, you know, to talk in a religious sense, God made human beings. He gave all of us a conscience. Even people who don't believe in God and people who are mixed up, and don't, they have a conscience. You know, there's an odd thing that when you live a lousy life and when, you, you, when you're bad to other people and when you just, you know, um, live for pleasure, you start to feel guilty. You, start, you practice acolasia, you start to make excuses, but you really know that they're, you end up in despair like Kierkegaard said. So, so what happened? You can't be happy unless you have self-esteem. And you can't have self-esteem unless you, you're able to say, not in a boastful way, but you're able to look at your life and say, yeah, I'm doing good things. And I'm doing things, ultimately, God is the, is, is the best judge. He's objective and whatever. But when you live your life in a moral way, in a Christian way, then you just naturally start to feel good about your life. And the trouble with hedonism is it, it ends up in egoism, in, in, um, in self-destructive behavior, in, uh, you know, Aristotle would say you can't even have true friendship without, with, uh, with hedonism because the hedonists are all concerned about themselves. True friendship is you love the other person. Just, you know, you love them in an other-directed love. If that's an important part of happiness, you can own. The kind of hedonism that you're talking about, which is, yes, that's what, it's because society has been dumbed down. And it's been dumbed down philosophically, logically. I mean, we're not paying attention to what the great thinkers thought, but religiously, in turn, because, well, for various reasons, this kind of secular humanism, secular uh, liberalism, basically, um, 
Again, you, you empty life of any kind of objective, transcendent, spiritual content. What are you left with? Well, you're left with your biological urges. Oh, uh, well, you satisfy as many of those as you can, and that's a life well of. But you know what? If you're not doing good things, you feel bad about yourself. And Foucault, I think, is a good example. Why do people become alcoholics? Why do people, you know, why pornography? Why, why are all these exaggerations? Well, Kierkegaard would have more to say about that, but it's basically because people don't feel self-esteem because they don't, in deep down inside, they know they're a pretty rotten piece of work and you can't be happy unless you have self-esteem. And it's almost like God has sort of put that in all of us. So, you know, even if you're not religious, um, I, do, I, I do think, again, religion is, and Christianity um, provides a quantum leap so where you can understand and it gives you motivation, pushes you in, in, in the better way. But even if you're not religious, inside of you, there's some understanding. Thomas Aquinas says, everybody's born with a natural law. Everybody as a human being knows the difference between right and wrong. Aristotle says the same thing. And if you're not doing what's right, then you're not going to be happy. That's how I would respond to that kind of thing.